Hello and welcome to Artifacts with Edie, a live show and tell of the artifacts from the Summit County Historical Society. My name is Edie Steiner and I'm a school-based music therapist with Bridges Learning Center in Akron, Ohio and with Akron Public Schools. And I'm also the shepherdess here at the Summit County Historical Society. Our weekly game show, Are You Smarter Than a Border Collie? takes place tomorrow live at 11:30. Each episode is your study guide for the week. Can you take home the title Smarter Than a Border Collie? Tune in to find out. Good morning to our scholars watching from Bridges Learning Center and a special congratulations to all of Mrs. Arrington's excellent readers over at Forest Hill Community Learning Center. Mrs. Arrington says, "Keep reading." I am broadcasting once again live here in the Carriage House at the Perkins Stone Mansion property in the heart of the city of Akron. This week we have been learning about what life was like here on the home front during World War II. Today we are going to be learning about some of the effects of war. Some of the effects of war are things that we can see and such as like destruction of buildings and other man-made or woman-made items as we've discussed earlier in the week, while others are changes or challenges in our belief system or our ideals. And those are things that we can't see, but are things that we feel and are the very core of who we are. So wars are often the result of differences in opinions or even beliefs. When two or more nations can't agree on something, they sometimes fight each other in an attempt really to win an argument. Scholars, friends, parents, grandparents, guardians, today's episode does not go into great detail of what war is because our focus this week has really been on the home front. However, it's always important to listen to your scholar and the things that they're saying to you. If war is equal to a disagreement, then parts of today's story may be too much for your scholar. Um, you could use the dogs as a guide, and when you see them back on the screen, that would be a great time to push play. For scholars with great under greater understanding of what is right and what is wrong, keep helping them to develop empathy by having conversations with them about what they're hearing and how they relate to it so they too can connect with all people. Simply asking what they think and what they feel when they hear this history will continue to also build a trusting relationship between you and your emerging scholar. And if you need help, the Summit County Historical Society is always here because history is always within reach. During World War II, there were two different sides. One was called the Axis Power and the other was called the Allies. The major Axis powers were Germany, Italy, and Japan. And the major allies were Great Britain, France, Canada, Australia, Russia, and the United States. Both sides had great differences in opinions. And here's where families help how this story is told. As a citizen of Summit County, we are tenderly educating our young scholars to ensure their well-being of all the citizens of Akron and Summit County. So during World War II was one of those differences in opinions, how certain groups of people were treated. For example, the Axis powers thought that Jewish LGBTQ any individual of African descent, intellectually and physically disabled people were not equal. Unfortunately, these beliefs led to the execution of over 6 million innocent people just because of their religion, just because of their beliefs, um, their heritage, or just because of the way that they were born. Humans, like people like you and me, for perspective, six million American women joined the workforce during World War II. Simply, there is so much for you to learn about the war than what we will talk about this week. Um, since our program really focuses on remember when in the home in and on the home front here in the United States, there are many important stories to be told but our focus today is still on the home front. 
So let's get to it, scholars. During World War II, and those dates again, 1941 to 1945, there were actually only 48 states, states which made up the United States during this time. Today, we have 50 nifty states. So our flag back then looked a little bit different and had fewer stars on it in the blue field up in that upper left-hand corner. So this is a picture of the 48 stars on that flag. The next picture shows you a 50 star flag. Can you spot the difference when they're side by side? On Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, the Naval and Air Forces of the Empire of Japan attacked our Navy docked at the Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, which is where we had one of our bases. The unprovoked attack destroyed many of our Navy ships and killed thousands of our sailors and soldiers. And eight of those were from Summit County. This event causes the United States to enter World War II in the Pacific. At that time, Hawaii was not a state. Not until August of 1959 did Hawaii become the 50th state. The tropical climate, which means it is very warm and humid much of the year, attracts many people to this very beautiful state. Hawaii is made up of several islands which have spectacular views of the ocean and many lush green trees and brightly colored flowers. It's truly a tropical paradise. Can you guess which state though is the 49th state? It's the only other state that's not attached to the mainland. This state is cold much of the year and has lots of wild open land. It's, you, if you guessed Alaska, then you're correct. In January of 1959, Alaska became a state. During World War II though, uh, Germany bombed Europe, especially Great Britain. And these daily bombing raids became raids quickly became the norm. So citizens, people like you and I, who weren't in the military, went to bomb shelters. And these were underground safe areas, uh, basements or tunnels, every time they heard an air raid siren to signify that the planes were sighted. They stayed in these shelters until um, the, the all clear siren was rang, so they would know that it was safe to go back home. And they had a hope they had hoped during this time that they also had a home that they could go back to. Bombs destroyed buildings, homes, or even entire blocks of buildings in just the blink of an eye. It was a very stressful time that changed people's lives. The loss of your home, the loss of loved ones, and with a real fear was was a real fear during this time. <laughs> States, we had a group of volunteers who trained for this task. The Air Raid Wardens of the Civilian Defense, or just CD for short, who were trained to instruct civilians what to do in case of a bombing attack right here in America. They would have instructed you where the nearest bomb shelter was and helped simulated bomb drills and to help keep us safe. Luckily for us, there were no bombing raids here in the United States during this time. During World War II, there were over 1,533 deaths of soldiers from Summit County. While wartime can be a period of great hardship and many deaths, new technology and innovation should also be recognized as part of this time period. Some of the things that we use every day and other things which are conveniences that we take for granted were actually invented during World War II. The candy we love to eat that melts in your mouth and not in your hands is a result of a need from World War II. In the South Pacific, it is very hot 
and traditional chocolate would not hold up to the heat. But it might sound like a small problem, but sticky fingers could mean defeat. So the military asked candy makers to come up with a candy that would not melt. And so now you know, M&M's, a candy coated in chocolate, was created in 1941. Did you know that the first electronic computer was also built during World War II? These early computers built in the United Kingdom in 1943 were very simple compared to our computers of today, and they were much, much larger, about the size of a small bedroom, as you can see in that picture. These computers could do pretty much simple math only, but they were much faster speeds and um, much faster than just using a regular adding machine or calculations being done by people. Today, computers are part of our everyday life and you might even be watching me on a small handheld computer right now. Have you ever played with a slinky? In 1943, a United States Naval engineer was working on a device that measured horsepower of a battleship's engines. When by accident, he discovered something extraordinary. A coiled steel spring that he was using fell onto the deck of the ship and began to walk across the deck itself. After the war, he marketed his accidental find as a toy called the Slinky. If you use a ballpoint pen, then you can thank the Royal Air Force. During the war, the United Kingdom pilots needed a way to mark charts. So when they mark them with virtual information about the enemy troop movements or weather conditions, the charts would not rip and, cheer, rip and tear. Pencils tore holes in the damp charts due to the weather and the moisture in the planes while flying above the clouds. Before the war in 1938, Hungarian Laszlo Biro invented a pen with a ball bearing um, tips so it wouldn't rip his paper. His brother helped him to invent a thinner ink to roll with it. Unfortunately, they had to escape Argentina for safety due to the Axis powers. Their invention was recognized first by American soldiers and then later produced by women in a factory in Great Britain so they could be used by the Royal Air Force. Now, most of us use one of these every day, probably even several times a day. So during the war, things were priced a little bit lower than today, but people made a lot less money. So here's some examples of prices here at home in 1943. In 1943, minimum wage was 43 cents an hour, or you earned $3.44 for eight hours of work at your job. A loaf of bread will cost you nine cents. You need a gallon of gas? That was 15 cents. Toothpaste was 37 cents a tube. A bottle of soda was five cents. How about a postcard to send to a friend? That'll set you back a penny. Sending an airmail? That will cost eight cents. Oh, oh I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, let's get ready to find out uh, what our artifact of the day is. But first, our delicious review. Question one. What was the 50th state in the United States? Was it A, Ohio, B, Michigan, C, Alaska, or D, Hawaii? If you said D, Hawaii, then aloha to you. Hawaii became a state in 1959. That was only 61 years ago. Question two. Rudy helped us learn a little bit more about a helmet by A, a soldier, B, an air raid wardens of the civilian defense, C, an air force shardens of minimal defense, or D, sailors. Wow, 
are you a pilot? Because you're pretty fly to us. You must have said, B, the air raid wardens of civilian defense. These volunteers would have instructed people like you and me where the nearest bomb shelter was and held simulated bombing drills, much like we do now to keep safe in school for fire drills and tornado drills and other disaster drills. They're just there to keep us safe and to help us protect ourselves. So our last question of the day is, what do you think was important for soldiers to have, I'm sorry, not what, but why? Why do you think it was important for soldiers to have chocolate in the South Pacific during the war? Remember, this is an opinion question. So as long as you support your answer with some facts, then your answer will be correct. Today's artifact of the day is a piece of equipment that was used to keep soldiers and civilians safe during World War II. Are you ready to learn what the artifact of the day is? Can you even guess? If you said a Mickey Mouse gas mask made right here in Summit County, then you are so fly that you must never land. We shared early that except for the attack on Pearl Harbor, no other land um, from the United States was threatened during World War II. Some people were worried that something would happen, so they planned ahead just in case. One individual that helped with this process was Walt Disney. His idea to make a mask to protect children included his favorite character, Mickey Mouse. A company in Barberton, Ohio then was contracted to make the mask. Dietrich Rimple, a toy designer, produced a mold for the Sun Rubber Company and they used it to make 1,000 masks. After the war, the company then made rubber toys of the Disney characters for people to buy. Are you familiar with Minnie Mouse and Pluto and Donald Duck and Bambi and Dumbo and Thumper the Rabbit? These were masks that they made for protection. So right now, doctors, nurses, painters, and even the rest of us, we're all wearing masks. So things we don't want to get into our lungs don't actually get into our lungs. So what are they called? They are called face masks, of course, Although they usually only cover our nose and mouth, right now we're of course wearing those to protect each other from spreading the COVID-19 virus. These masks were, um, they're, they're an important step to help us stay healthy and safe right now. So this mask was made to protect a child during very different times. I'm gonna show you that, that picture of the mask again. And it, it's called a gas mask. It would have been important to keep someone from getting sick and breathing unsafe gases. A gas mask filters out gases from the air to keep them out of your lungs. It seals tight around your face and your head and to keep the gases away from you. There's lenses over the eyes in the mask that would allow you to see out when the mask is worn. The gas mask is a very uncomfortable type of mask, but it would have saved a lot of a lot of lives of soldiers when they wore them. Soldiers first used gas masks during World War I, but also during World War II, and more recently during the Gulf War. And we hope that no one will ever have to wear this type of mask again. But did you know who invented the first gas mask? Garrett Morgan. He's an African-American inventor who's actually from Cleveland, Ohio, and inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for two inventions, the gas mask and the traffic light. In 1914, Morgan applied for a patent for his breathing device. When there was an accident in 1916, Morgan and his brother used the devices to save the lives of two people who were trapped in a tunnel under Lake Erie. The idea of this invention led to the development of future masks that would save even more lives. So ask yourself, what are you good at and how can you possibly use your ideas to help other people? We are so excited for your future Young Scholars and tomorrow we will be here testing your knowledge against the Border Collies. 
I will be posting the game code by 11 a.m. in our Facebook story. We are also going to be posting a Google Meet for you so you could play live in there. Um, playing and joining the Google Meet will allow you to be live with my computer screen. Um, there's been a little bit of a delay um, coming through the Switcher Studio and Facebook. So join the Google Meet and play your own Kahoot game against the Border Collies live. And um, tomorrow I will see you for another exciting episode of Artifacts with Edie, where I show and tell the artifacts from the Summit County Historical Society, where history is always within reach. We'll see you tomorrow.